Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to um, this meeting of the Health and Wellbeing Board at Derby City Council on Thursday, the 12th of November. Thank you ever so much for taking the time to attend today. I know in our fields we're all very busy at the moment, but uh, it's a while since we've managed to hold a, a board meeting, so I think it's important that we do that. Um, can I take any... <laughs> okay, I a late echo. Um, right, so can I take any apologies, please? Hi, yes, we've got apologies from Merrill Watkins, Tim Broadley, Ifty Majid, Helen Dillerstone, Gavin Boyle, Pervez Sadiq, and Beverly Smith. Okay, thank you. If we can note those. Um, any late items? Not that I'm aware of. No, none. Any declarations of interest on today's agenda, please? Okay, so then we have the item four is the minutes of the meeting held on the 16th of January. So it was a while ago since we uh, were able to meet before the first lockdown. So uh, if people can remember those, is there anything in those minutes that uh, we need to take account of now or will things be dealt with in the course of the agenda. Alison, do you think things are covered? Yeah, Councillor Porter, I mean, they're, they're so long ago now, aren't they? I think we've changed significantly, so I think, yeah, happy to move on. Okay, so um, I think we've had a request then to deal with the item that's going to be presented by Kirsty McMillan, which was at item 8, uh, the Better Care Fund update. Did we want to do that one first, uh, Kirsty? Yes, thank you very much for taking me out of turn. Um, our health and social care system has what's known as a kind of silver command call at 1.30, so I need to go to that, which is why I need to be slightly out of turn. Apologies for that. Um, this report would have come in September, actually, and it was giving an update as at the end of March, really, around the Better Care Fund and the progress over the previous financial year. Um, I do actually have a presentation that goes with this. So I just wanted to check whether you wanted me to try and share that or whether you just want me to talk you through it, because it, the actual report doesn't have the detail that you might want to see. Firstly, by all means, if you want to give it a try, we'll see how it works. Okay, um, let's just have a look. <clears throat> sure. I've tried. Does anything come through? Doesn't look like it. Kirsty, I've just made you a presenter. Can you try again? Okay, you, yes. You were down as an attendee. Thank you. It, yeah, it wasn't giving me that option. Oh, that's better. Okay. Share. My kind of just before you start that, Kirsty, Lindsay, have we identified the uh, anonymous guest on the list of visitors? <laughs> Lindsay, can you hear me? Sorry, yes, I can, and we've identified the anonymous guest. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Can I okay. check then, Chair? Can you see what's on the screen? Yes, Kirsty, you can. Thank okay, you. that's great. Yes, I've only got a few slides. I won't take too long. I can also hear a barking dog, which I don't think is in my building because I'm in the council house. So apologies about that if anyone else can hear that. Um, yes, just a quick reminder then. So the Better Care Fund is a sort of joint planning vehicle between health and social care. And it's been around for a number of years now. Obviously, the kind of process at the moment has been significantly delayed as a result of COVID. And we haven't actually published plans for the current financial year or for the following financial year. Similarly, there's obviously been quite a lot of work around restoring NHS services in particular as a result of the first wave of COVID. And, and it may well be that in the future, there will be a, a more radical 
reshaping of the integration agenda between health and social care. Uh, but the advice we've been getting from government in the meanwhile is that we do we should carry on with the arrangements that the funding is currently providing for. Um, and we do still work together between health and social care commissioners and providers. Um, and we continue with the commitments that are at the bottom part of that sl slide, really, which underpin the Better Care Fund. So I won't go through those because um, we have had them here before. Quick reminder, because this is effectively a pooled budget between the local authority and the clinical commissioning group. Um, so I can only really give you last year's full full year uh, for the reasons that I've stated that we're in a bit of a, a sort of flux year as a result of COVID. Um, but you can see that the fund is just over 31 and a half million and that will roll forward into the current financial year. But as yet, we're not clear on the arrangements for the following year as a result of all the kind of turbulence in the system. Um, what we had to report back to the centre, to the Department of Health and Social Care, and obviously the Health and Wellbeing Board is a, a key governance vehicle for the Better Care Fund, really, is how we, we were doing jointly on our joint priorities as at the end of March. And obviously the end of March was a very difficult period for the health and social care system. And it's very difficult to know really how much of the performance was directly attributable to the remainder of the year or whether actually what was going on in February in March was really quite skewing things. So, for example, on the first objective around the numbers of people who were admitted to hospital non-electively, that is on an emergency basis, we weren't on track to meet, um, we didn't meet our target at the end of March um, Obviously, it's difficult to unpick the impact of COVID and actually what was going on in terms of hospital attendances. And we will just have to expect that that will continue this year. Um, so I do think, you know, some allowances will be made in terms of trying to understand the, the overall position. Um, in terms of the next one, which is about the number of people who were admitted to residential care, we were on track towards the end of March. I suppose one of the things I should say is a lot of the reporting mechanisms were disrupted during March and April. Um, so there's a bit of a, a lag in terms of the performance figures, but I can definitely confirm we, we did meet our target around reducing the number of people who were permanently admitted to residential care because we're trying to look for alternative forms of um, accommodation. However, it is likely that COVID was a major factor in relation to admissions to residential care because very few people apart from some people possibly um, being being a discharged from hospital or back to their own care home. Were at, there were very few new admissions into care homes during March and April, actually. And that, that is part of the, the national trend. So this is about permanent admissions. Um, we, we, we did meet our target, but like I say, it's quite difficult to unpick, you know, what we would attribute, to, attribute that to. And then the other couple of areas that we focus on with the Better Care Fund is about the number of people who remain home after they've been discharged from hospital for three months. How, how many people are still at home for three months after they've experienced a period of rehabilitation or reablement in the community? Now, we've always focused the city's resources towards the hospital in terms of ensuring that those are the people who are prioritised. What that actually means is that the acuity of people that we tend to support means that some of them sadly um, don't survive beyond the three months or they actually end up returning to hospital or going into a permanent care setting. So we did narrowly miss our target um, and again what's going to happen or what was planned to happen this year was a further development around expanding the reablement offer so that people within the community could benefit from that but again COVID has disrupted that somewhat but that urgent community response is still being delivered it's just going at a slower pace and then the last one where we were able to meet the target um, was in relation to the number of people who were delayed in terms of leaving hospital so a huge amount of work's been done in Derby in recent years about improving our discharge pathways and making sure we've got facilities for people to go to if they can't ordinarily go home um, and we, we did do very well in relation to that last year and we continue to. As it stands the government is no longer monitoring this target because of the Covid effort and um, because we're, we're trying to maintain discharges to keep the hospital going by discharging people on the same day that they are considered medically ready to go. So some of this is just a little bit out of line as a result of the COVID pressures.
There were some areas that we did not so well at, and, and in part that is about the pressures on having a large teaching hospital and the fact that the demand for A&E activity throughout the year continued to increase. Um, and I think as a result of some of these pressures, we, we were looking to try and pool some other resources through the Better Care Fund, but we haven't been able to do that. Um, and in part, that's the wider pressure on the financial position between health and social care. But the things that I'd say, and this is my last slide, you'd be glad to know the things I would say, would say that we've been doing really well on is you know we do work extremely well between health and social care and it's not just commissioners that would also be our provider organizations and we have got a selection of performance measures that we work on jointly because we understand um how connected each other each other is and the example i've put on the slide is just around for example making sure uh, that people get access to equipment to help them either leave hospital or remain independent at home and you know we do that jointly we we jointly commit mission, those sorts of interventions. And, you know, there's been a lot of difficulties throughout COVID, but it has certainly forged even greater integration on, on the ground, I suppose, between organisations in responding to the needs of citizens. And, you know, it'll be interesting to see where we go post-COVID to see how much, you know, that integration is more formalised um, in terms of some of the national policy directives. We also did a fantastic amount of work in terms of the community hub. And I suppose even though that wasn't driven by the Better Care Fund as such, some of the recipients, so the local area coordinators are paid for from the Better Care Fund. They were absolutely instrumental in assisting with that community response during the first wave of COVID. And obviously that's being stepped up at the moment. So, you know, I think it is fair to say that that joint working and, and pooling of resources stood us in good stead as we tackled with the pandemic and as we continue to do so that was all I was going to say chair and if there's any further questions um Kate Brown in the CCG leads on this and I obviously lead for Derby City uh, but we're still waiting for the guidance for the current year and we're we're hoping that in the um, Chancellor's next budget that, you know, the long term future around health and social care integration may feature in terms of finance and planning. But that's all I'll say to just now. And I'll take my presentation down if that's OK. Thank you, Kirsty. Um, clearly, uh, you've highlighted one of the only advantages uh, to come out of COVID, which is the uh, ability, our ability to work together more closely. Uh, clearly, all the measures that we've talked about are, are or potentially are severely affected by the effects of COVID. And it makes you wonder what this will look like when we get a chance to draw breath and redraw what is going to happen. Can I just ask one about care homes? And one of the targets was to reduce the number of people going into care homes. That's obviously happened already naturally as a result of COVID. Are we at risk of, uh, of uh, a situation where the number of admissions is potentially going to make some of the care homes unsustainable if they don't get the numbers? Absolutely, we are. Across Derby and Derbyshire, at any point over the past few months, some of the vacancy rates have been eye-watering. Uh, I think on average, it's been anywhere between 15 and 20% of available residential care beds have been empty. Some homes have got vacancies in excess of 50%. Um, and I think had it not been for the support of local authorities, the CCG, primary care, there's an awful lot of support being wrapped around care homes at the moment. And had the government not given financial support, which they have done, I think many care homes by now may have already gone under, but there's an awful lot of support going into care homes to keep the sector going over the next six to 12 months. I suppose what we don't know is what that will look like beyond that short to medium term, but absolutely that has been affected by death deaths in care homes and also people you know not wanting to move into a care home right now and the same is equally applicable to nursing homes. If anything, I'd say it's more exaggerated in nursing homes. So bizarrely, we could find ourselves reversing that uh, measure and trying to get people's confidence back up into into being able to uh, use the care and the, and the nursing care facilities. So we'll have to see how that one develops. So, any questions, comments for Kirsty, please?
No. All right, just a comment from me then uh, in relation to the LACs. Absolutely, they've played a very, very important part in the in the work that's been done by the hub, partly because some of their roles were were not um, they're not able to fulfil them as they normally would, but they've certainly mucked in and joined in and uh, and helped with the work along the way. So, uh, if I could pass my thanks to them and the organisation uh, behind them, that would be great. Um, and unless there's anything else, then I'm, I suppose we let Kirsty go about her business. And, uh, Pete, we'll Peter on. Moore Peter has Moore. requested. Oh, sorry. Yes, I didn't see that. Peter. Are you there, Peter? You're not muted, are you, Brian? He says he's muted and, and doesn't know how to. I think he's got a problem unmuting in the chat. I've just unmuted him, but it doesn't seem to be working. The university might have IT going on. Can you try again, Lindsay? Sorry, I've been trying to unmute him. I've moved him up to be a presenter, brought him back down again, but it doesn't seem to be working at all. Um, I don't know whether he can make his comment in the chat, if it's a short comment. Is that possible? It's on the... just typing now, Lindsay. Okay, thank you. Okay. Whilst we're waiting for Peter, then, were there any others? I can't see any more in the the chat line. May I just ask whether the, there was an announcement earlier this week from uh, Matt Hancock that there was going to be 2.2 million people who would be um, receiving vitamin D as a through the post and I think that was being angled towards care homes I just wondered if we knew any more about that. I've not heard any more about that I don't know whether anyone from public health has got more details. It's not something I've heard about either, so but I'll certainly have a look into it. Hi, can people hear us? Yes. yes. Can. That Peter? All right, okay. Thanks very much for that. So, um, I mean, I, I think just two very specific points, really. One, just I think gratitude for everyone's contribution to the work through the Better Care Fund over the past uh, few months has made it absolutely... Um, I think it, it's, it's a huge impact across the across the system. Certainly, uh, supporting patients uh, out of out of the acute sector uh, with that. Um, I think that my, my my only plea, I guess, is that I know we've discussed that there might be new arrangements in place for next year. But I would just on on the basis and the grounds that this is currently a really helpful tool that we probably haven't what we, we've used it, but we haven't necessarily exhausted the potential in it. So I wouldn't. I'd just say that let's let's not just discard it just yet using the Better Care Fund. Let's make sure that we um, actually get the right sort of uh, effort across not just commissioners and the, and the local authority, but actually the, how the whole system, system, health and social care can work into developing the plans for next year. Yes, I would agree with that. The, the intention behind it was to drive forward with integration um, and for various reasons. There's been some progress, but not as not as much as we could have. And I think COVID is the opportunity, really, regardless of the funding mechan that mechanism that we need to take. And if the Better Care Fund is the you know, the vehicle to help us do that, we should do. But the principle that Peter's just described, I would completely support. We need to move forward with closer integration. And the, the, the final point would be just a suggestion around there was the Pioneer um, Fund, I think, who were who were part of the better care, the initial rollout of the better care fund. And it, there's probably some useful learning to be to be taken from some some of that as well, which we could possibly adopt locally. Absolutely, yeah. Peter. Thank you um, on both counts. Good points, well made. Um, anybody else? Yeah, I've indicated I wanted to speak. Sorry, Farid, yes, not seeing that. Go on. 
No problem. Um, Kirsty, obviously, residential sector was causing us a big worry because uh, the uh, the occupancy levels did drop during the COVID or when the COVID was its peak, and they, they, they had start the occupancy levels did start to get better, and then we've had the second phase. You did say the government has actually offered financial assistance to tie them over the difficult time. I was wondering whether you could comment on the nature of the assistance that's being given to, uh, to, 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 to the care home sector by the government. So we can make an assessment whether it's going to keep them going for how long. <laughs> Yes. Okay. I'll very briefly do that then. They've they've given. I mean, they've given a lot of resources, but in terms of the two direct ways they've been helping financially, they've been providing them with an amount of free PPE because PPE was something, if you recall, seems like a long time ago, that was very very difficult to get hold of. Uh, so it doesn't. They're, they're not having all of their PPE needs met, but a good proportion of that is now being provided free, which obviously has a financial benefit. And secondly, they introduced and it was called the Infection Prevention and Control Fund, which was a ring fence grant passed through local authorities for every care home on a kind of um, per bed basis and there are there are some grant conditions around that which are primarily about managing the risk of infection and managing uh, particularly the, the community transmission between staff and residents uh, so there were some limitations to that but um, all care homes were entitled to that and that will continue until the end of March so I don't think they were able just to give out money without conditions you know we, we've had to kind of assist with assuring government in relation to that so I suppose it's after the end of March, really, where depending on where we're at with the pandemic, that we'll need to see around the long term funding support for care homes. Hope that's helpful. Thank you. OK. I see Lucy's keeping us well up to speed with uh, vitamin D. I'm sure those people will benefit greatly from it. Right. Any other questions please, for Kirsty before she departs us? Thank you, Kirsty. I'll let you go Thank you for having me. To your next meeting. Thank you very much. So to return to the agenda, I think we have, if we've got the order the same as it is printed, and it's uh, Camille who's going to talk to us about joint commissioning governance. Thank you, Chair. Um, if I refer to the main report, and I'll pull out headlines uh, within that report, if that's okay, Chair. Thank you. Um, so the covering report um, outlines that the uh, integrated commissioning strategy sets out the commissioning principles and priorities uh, for children and young people um, across the City Council and Derbyshire and, Derby and Derbyshire CCG over the next three years. Uh, 1.2 is just setting out that the purpose of this is it's intended to support the local authority and the CCG in, in carrying out their duties to cooperate with one another, um, help with integration and secure um, and enhance health, the, the health and welfare of children and young people uh, as required by legislation and best, best practice. Uh, and 1.3 is just setting out, it is one of a series of initiatives aimed at strengthening governance and joint commissioning uh, for children and young people uh, across Derby, Derby City. Um, the headlines in the main body of the report are at 4.2, um, the points being outlined there are, is that the, the strategy is setting out a sense of direction and to enable cohesive planning, providing consistency of a way of working uh, and maximising combined LA and CCG expertise and experience um, to optimal effect. 4.4 um, is outlining, of course, in addition to this overarching commissioning strategy, we're, all, we're also working on our Senate commissioning strategy as part of the written statement of action. That's now been improved by the Senate Strategy Board and will be coming for, for information to the next Health and Wellbeing uh, Board, all part of an integrated uh, approach uh, to children and people, including Senate. 
4.5 is outlined how this overarching joint commission strategy was developed. It's based on uh, the, the national sort of integration framework called Better Outcomes Framework, and that's how this has been developed. Uh, and as commissioners have assessed how well we as a local area across health and, and the council are doing and what we need to do, do better. 4.7 is outlining that of one of the assessed domains in relation to building strong foundations and relationships um, that, that certainly being identified as one of the, the areas for improvement um, and research of course shows that where integrated commissioning works well much more effort has gone into building strong foundations um, and then maintaining those, those foundations. An action plan will be developed, of course, over the next 12 months on those areas that need to be, be developed. And 4.9 is also outlining um, kind of the strategy also considers a better join up uh, and effective linkage uh, with local governance arrangements, for example, Health and Wellbeing Board, Joined Up Care Derbyshire Children's Board and Children Families Learners Board. And 5.1 in terms of consultation is outlining there that this strategy has been um, consulted with, with the Children's Partnership Boards, Joint Up Care Derbyshire, Children Families Learners Board, Local Area Send Board um, for feedback. Um, and 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 um, and that's been incorporated into uh, the, the document. And the recommendation chair under 2.1 is to approve the approve the integrated commission strategy for children and young people, which is attached as appendix two. If I pause there, chair, happy to take any questions. Thank you, Gamal. Um, right, so quite a lot in there. Uh, any questions, Lucy? You wanted to come in. Yeah, thank you, Chair. As, um, in the diagram, I think it's Appendix 1 that's, a, that's included in this, there's a comment that individual plans, EHTPs, should be uh, informing the JSNA process, which makes absolute sense, and I think the diagram's very helpful. Now, within the city, we've got good news about the way those are going, certainly in terms of the new plans, and I think there's, there's the feel that the reviews of plans will also be moving forward in a, a positive way over the next few months. And I wondered, given the that key uh, linkage between plans and the um, JSNA and the strategy, whether we ought to be keeping in mind that it might be appropriate for us to review this document um, before it's actually come up, out of, run out of its time period, as it were. So I'm not saying we should be, but I'm just saying that can we just keep in mind that it might be that it gets out of date earlier if there are significant changes as a result of those ES EHCPs being issued. Yeah. Thank you, Chair, for the comment on that. Yeah, that, that's perfectly sensible over the three-year uh, period of the overarching Joint Commissioning Strategy um, to be reviewing that at, at a sensible point in time. And, Chair, just to confirm, in terms of that pyramid uh, diagram, Lucy, you're referring to, and the education and health care plans, um, the SEND Commissioning Strategy, which will sit underneath the strategy, uh, which will come to this board, outlines four priorities, and those four priorities which have been co-produced with parents link back to the SEND strategy, the JSNA, and have been co-produced with parents. So, Chair, when that strategy comes in here, you'll see the connectivity between education and healthcare plans, SEND strategy, and the overarching SEND specific joint commissioning strategy to ensure integration and linkage, which has been co-produced by the local area and parents in particular. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Lind, maybe on the same subject? Hi. Thank you, Chair. Um, in relation to increasing local sufficiency and joined up working to enable children and young people to remain in their communities, please, could you elaborate on that? Yeah, so, th so that will be, if I give you, I mean, there's a number of examples because this is an overarching children commissioning strategy. So if I give you an example, for example, it could be, and I'll just use um, children in care as an example. So what we would want to be doing across the area would be saying, can we ensure um, children in care placements are made where possible within, for example, a 20-mile radius of, of Derby? 
So it's around working with health and ourselves to ensure placement sufficiency. And I'm just using children in care as an example. There could be others are to ensure local provision. Um, and, and, and Daniel, if your question was kind of more in relation to SEND, I think then, of course, that is also pivotal around how do we ensure um, services for families locally, including special needs placements and other aspects. So in summary, it's around an overarching strategy in terms of commissioning to ensure local provision um, and local placements where it's necessary for children and young people. So is that is that a strategy within the strategy that's yet to be co-produced? The, 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 are you talking in relation to the SEND strategy? Uh, yeah, and, and the children's one, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so underneath this so one, you're getting an um, echo. <laughs> yes, yeah, I don't think it's coming from mine. That, that's okay. <laughs> I just don't know. Yeah, yes, uh, uh, Danny, I'm just answering your question. Yes, so underneath this overarching uh, commissioning strategy, there, there is another um, uh, SEND commissioning strategy, which, which will, will bring some of that information out as well. Okay, so will this come back to us later then, when um, there's more detail and it's been co-produced moving forward? Well, well, this one um, is the actual strategy. What I think this forum may wish is to progress on the overall this this strategy in its journey and to get some updates in relation to how effectively is the CCG and the council working to improve outcomes for children because this, this is a kind of high level strategy which is around um, focusing on integration and partnership between the CCG and the councils in order to improve outcomes for children, whatever they may be. There may be placements, there may be other things, but it's that strategic um, kind of endorsement by the Health and Wellbeing Board and, as you can see, by Joined Up Care Derbyshire around how it will work to ensure whatever the system does for children is just to its best of ability with an integrated approach, including examples like that. So, Chair, in terms of would be sensible, for example, to say, well, actually, because this is more of a partnership document around six to 12 months, well, how effective has the joint commissioning strategy been? That's more generic, certainly happy to do that. And then more specific, which the SEND strategy board will be doing, is the specific send joint commissioning strategy which interfaces with the send strategy which is also on its way to cabinet so sorry that's a bit wordy but that's the kind of layers it's trying to put in place so children and young people are at the heart of what the ccg and the council does overarching and then more specifically this strategy is going to be underpinned then with another strategy which is the the, the send commissioning strategy okay thank, thank you, you. Any other questions or comments? Camille will ask to agree one one recommendation, I think. Or that just That's right, Chair, yeah, thank you. Are we all agreed? Thank you. All right, thank you, Gamel. Um We can then move on to item seven, which is Chris Clayton and the Joined Up Care Derbyshire update. Uh, thank, thanks, Chair. Um, I hope you can hear me. I've had terrible challenges with IT, so just apologies. I've been in and out of this meeting, uh, hopefully not cause too much dis uh, disruption. Um, Lindsay's going to upload very kindly the slides because I just, um, for some reason, don't have access uh, to be able to do it. So if, if, if that's all right, Lindsay, are you... Yeah, I, I can start doing that now if you want me to. Yes. That would be, that would be wonderful if you could. And I, I'll, I, can, I can now see... Uh, the 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 um the screen which will which will help so um I'm, I'm hoping I can they're coming up as we speak I think I've got them Chris yes by the minute okay so so I'm hoping there we are that's perfect Lin, Lindsay if you could put them into um into read view they're just um. OK, yeah. And if you yep. let me know when to move on. I will certainly. And thank you, everybody, for um, for bearing with. So um, if I could go to. Yeah, well, that's perfect. Lindsay, if I could go to the next slide, please. Uh, basically, um, I'm, thanks for having me. And I, I'm really there's, there's a couple of things in this presentation that I'm, 
that I really want to pull out and I want to ultimately pull out about developing a, a more coherent, I suppose, relationship between Joined Up Care Derbyshire as, as it's starting to, to really come together around and, and the Health and Wellbeing Board. And, and, and hopefully um, that's the sort of conversation we'll get into. Ultimately, though, um, obviously with recent events, it, it's made us all take stock. And, and so the, the Derby and Derbyshire system, the sort of health and social care system, we're really thinking about, you know, what are we here to do? What's our role? And, and how do we really start to make some inroads into, into health inequality? And so, as you'd have naturally expect, we've, we've had a bit of a sort of stop at stop moment and, and, and think through, whilst obviously continuing to support the whole system as, as it goes. If I would just have the next slide, uh, please, I'd be grateful. Thank you. Well, the, the, there's three questions we've just been working through over the last couple of months, and this might sound um, quite basic, but it's been quite an important fundamental uh, viewpoint because when I, when I started to pick up the role of the sort of exec lead for, for the system, I, I sort of asked, talked to a lot of people, and, 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 and to be honest with you, there wasn't clarity about who and what the Joint Up Care Derbyshire um, system is and what, what its priorities are. And, 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 you know, and, and I think I asked 10 people and I got 10 different views of, of what we were here to do. So it felt important to stop. And then clearly, I'm working through the questions now about if this is who we are, and those are our priorities. How are we going to do that then? How are we going to operate as a system? And then, and then, and then, obviously, uh, we get into the actions that we're going to, to to take. And if I could just have the next slide, please, Lindsay. Okay, this this might sound obvious to you, but it wasn't obvious to us. And and um, so, to cut a long story short, we've we we've all agreed that joined up care Derbyshire is 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 the is the health and social care partnership for Derby and Derbyshire, which includes uh, all aspects of health, not just um, the NHS traditional health services, it includes our public health services that we'd all recognise and and those other types of of health care out there. It's not just the traditional services such as general practice hospitals, it's it's much broader than that. And social care the partnership and, and it's all age, it's for adults and children. And that's that's been quite important in terms of understanding what the partnership is there for. And then if I could just take you through where we think our, what our priorities are. So if we go to the next slide, please, Lindsay. Well, you then once you know, work out who you are, you then sort of say, well, what are we here to do? And, and, and I think we're still clear on trying to improve life expectancy and healthy life expectancy in, in uh, for, for Derby and Derbyshire in comparison to other parts of the country because as you know and this board knows sadly we, we, we're lower than, than the rest of the country in many areas and the next couple of slides just say why so if I go on to to that Lindsay please next slide and, and the reasons for that we know here uh, still are cardiovascular disease, cancer and respiratory, those three are the, the, the biggest causes of death in, in our population. And then when you think about musculoskeletal disease and mental health, those are some of the biggest causes of disability, particularly back pain, causing roughly 8% of, 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 of all disability. So it's, it's, it's a significant challenge to us. Of course, we need to understand what the impact of COVID-19 has been on, on this, as, as you'd imagine. And we're, we're going to work through that just to see if, if it's changed those. And then if I could just have the next slide, um, please, Lindsay. And, and this is this is a slide you'll be familiar with. We talked about it before, um, but it, it, it's going to fundamentally shape what we do from a joined up care Derbyshire perspective, because 80 percent of those uh, those outcomes I've just talked about are, are determined outside of um, what's termed here as the clinical care element. So that 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 care that can be delivered through the joined up care Derbyshire partnership is contributing about 20 percent. The rest are in these wider determinants that I know this board understands uh, significantly. And then, Lindsay, if I could just have the next slide, please. And you might just need to click it two or three times to get it to come on. It's an animated one. And then one more go. Perfect. Thank you very much. It's, you've been doing mar marvellously well on this. Um, so what what this slide demonstrates 
is is the interconnectivity and we can, we can talk about where the circles need to be um um, and how they overlap. But essentially what, what I'm trying to set out here is, is, is joined up care Derbyshire. It doesn't operate in a vacuum. It operates in a multitude of other partnerships. So we've got this partnership on, on this call now with the, the health and wellbeing partnership. And, and of course, we've got a, a broader partnership, the, the sort of what I'm terming the socioeconomic partnership. And, and my example of that, my understanding would be the the Derby Partnership Board that's that started to to galvanise uh, over the last um, couple of months, and 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 somehow, if we're going to make a difference on that, um, those healthy life expectancy, we're going to have to think about all those different partnerships and and influence in there. And then, if I could have the next slide, please, Lindsay. So this just says, look. If we go back to twenty percent being in the gift, the direct gift. Of, of joined up care Derbyshire, but we but we want to improve healthy life expectancy. We're going to have to lead, act, and influence in, in all those different spheres, and that's why I've brought this to, uh, here today to just think about those different spheres and and and, and how we operate. And then it, I'm going to talk about some of the the thoughts we have. So if I just have the next couple of slides, please, Lindsay. I'll take the next one first. So, what's driving inequality, health inequality in joined up care Derbyshire's viewpoint. So what's in our direct control? Well, it's about health and social care delivery. Uh, it's about the demands on service. It's about access, provision, the quality, um, the experience of care. And, and, and something we're thinking through, and I know this board's cognizant of, is, is taking a, a prevention first approach. Dean has done some work with the board, um, County DPH, Robin's fully cited on it in terms of how do we take a prevention first approach in the way we do care. So that feels a really important way that we can uh, influence change. But there are others, of course. And if I just talk about um, within that, if I have the next slide, please, um, Lindsay. Thank you. Within that, there are some specific health um, and care challenges. So urgent care, particularly Think about COVID and, and, and non-COVID disease, winter and, and that whole system is a real challenge. We've been talking, hearing from Kirsty and, and Peter earlier. Cancer and what we call elective care, those routine operations, that's a big area for, for the health system. And mental health and learning disability are, are, are three big areas where we want to really focus on in terms of that 20% and making a difference. And if I could just have the next uh, slide. But it's not all bad news. It's not all challenge. So what we're sort of saying here is that we've got a lot going for us, and sometimes it doesn't always feel that we look at it in that way. So we've got a lot of big assets. We've got we've got thousands of people who work in, in this system. We've got we the, the, the NHS alone spends two billion pounds if we include specialised commissioning uh, there. And and I suppose what what we're thinking about now is how do we bring all these different approaches in to improve those outcomes? And then, Lindsay, if I could, I'm going to take the, the board just through some um, some governance type areas, if you wouldn't mind, and you bear with me. So if I could have the, now this slide, Lindsay, you're going to have to keep pressing the button, I'm afraid. It's a, it's, it's a bit of an irritating slide in the way I've done it. Apologies. It's um, it, 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 it's going to show you here, and as Lindsay's busy, busy typing away there, it's it's showing all the things in in sort of headline terms that that we as a system think are just really important. And having taken the board, the joint at care board, through through the last uh, couple of months thinking about this, these are the sort of headings that have come out, you know, and sort of integration health outcomes transformation those sorts of things are really crucial to what we're trying to do and and, and what i've done and with the support of the board and if i take the next slide is i've sort of grouped those into really theme areas that the board needs to focus on and when i talk about the board i'm obviously talking about the joint care derbyshire board those are these are the areas that we really need to focus on and and getting our strategic intent right is, is really important. So I think Councillor Kerr was talking earlier around 
the use of the JSNA, how are we doing that? How, how are we cited on the things that we need to do? Um, the next one is, is, is clearly partnership and strategic relationships. We're, we're not going to get far unless we really work in partnership and be coherent about that partnership. We're going to use our assets very, very carefully. They're, they're, they're an important resource, but using it very carefully. And, and we've got to get better at uh, intelligence and the use of, of information. And of course, none of this will happen unless we we really support this through through strategic leadership. Now, I'm going to get to the money now. You'll be glad to hear. So if I could just have the next slide, please, Lindsay, and just and if you take it through uh, to its to, to its next until um, I'll tell you when next one. One last one. Perfect. There. What 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 the board? Oh, sorry, Lindsay. Sorry. Just go back one. Nearly there. Just got, if you could, oh, apologies, I've messed you up. What what I was saw it showing on that um, big chart, and the with the blue slide, is um, the work of the board and the work we're going to take through the board. Thanks ever so much, Lindsay. And what we're saying here is that the joined up care board needs to now be properly influenced by strategic intent. This arrow up at the top that, that Lindsay's working through now, we're going to have to get much more clear about use of our assets and we're going to have to get much more clear about the strategic partnerships we want to operate on. And if I could take you to the next slide, Lindsay, I know this is challenging for colleagues and um, I'm sorry the IT hasn't worked for me this afternoon. But if I could take you to that overview slide. Essentially, what, what this is saying in very, very simple terms, and I know it's not this simple, is, is, and this is where I think the Health and Wellbeing Board comes through quite strongly here in the importance of the board, is what's in front of you in the blue circle in the middle is, is joined up care, is that is that health and social care system. Thanks, Lindsay. I, I, I can see that really well. Thank you. And when you've got the board in the middle, but there's two red boxes there where I think it's really important we've got to work. The first box in the top the, the, in the red is this strategic intent. So being really, really clear on what our outcomes are. And that has to be influenced by the st strategy of the health and wellbeing boards. It has to be coming through through the health and wellbeing um, board strategies, the, the um, start well, live well, age well, die well concepts. It, uh, it's got to be influenced there to direct the work of the health and social care system. And then secondly, there's something we need to do in partnership with these outer circles. And, and, and we can argue about the where the circles need to be and what the linkages are. But this this thought about we've got to work in strategic partnership about what, what's joined up care doing in that 20 percent sphere? And how do we connect with these wider partnerships in a more coherent way, uh, both in the health and well-being space and that bigger macro socioeconomic space? And then you'll be glad to hear, Lindsay, it's nearly over. Uh, the last slide, there, the last slide, if you don't mind, it's just so. Look, I, I know that's been challenging from a presentation point of view, but uh, thank you to Lindsay for you've done, you've done a marvelous job. But I, I hope that's just set up really quickly that we've just reaffirmed what joined up care Derbyshire is. Which I hope I've sort of set out what we think is in our gift, the joined up care Derbyshire gift to do and, and the sort of key areas we're working on. But just this pushing this concept of, right, let's get let's, you know, we'd like to get serious about partnership working and let's and hopefully this is a helpful conversation to have there. Chair. So I'll stop there and, and take any questions. Thank you ever so much. Thank you, Chris. Very detailed and clear presentation. Um, can I just, before I bring people and I've got three next, but just in relation to our ambition or our challenge to improve healthy life expectation locally, how are we going to deal with maintaining those levels when, um, never mind improving them, when uh, as a unavoidable consequence of COVID, some healthcare and um, and some operations and appointments are having to be cancelled. How do we, as a, in a joined up way, approach catching these back up and, and helping with our prevention of, uh, of serious illness? It, 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 Chair, it's a crucial point. Um, and, and this is, 
I snuck it in that slide right at the beginning that said, look, pre-COVID, these were our challenges. Um, and, and a little sentence there, which is probably understated, that says we now need to relook at that in light of what we've we've gone through. So a, 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 a real example for you is is uh, the the waiting time for routine surgery. Um, you know, before COVID and March, we got the number of patients waiting over 52 weeks uh, for their operation right down into single figures in, in this in this uh, you know health economy. And now I'm afraid, you know, as we know it, there, there, there are several thousand that are waiting. And that's, that's, that's just one example of, of a change. And so we are going to have to review where, where we now are on our, on our outcomes. And then, and like you say, then, so what, what, as a partnership, what can we do? Um, and but, but I agree with you that the, the position may have changed. I think part of the problem, Chris, is we don't know the full legacy in this regard, do we? No. Of COVID until we've got somewhere near out the other end. Um, but I think it's very obvious that it will leave a serious legacy like that. And the government and the NHS and everybody else is going to have to find a way of trying to recoup that ground. Yeah. So, Fareed, you, you asked to come in. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, the, the research which I've recently read was actually pre COVID. And it indicated that for the first time since the inception of NHS, the average life expectancy nationally has taken a drop or has become stagnant. It's national study, and I'm assuming same will be true in Derby. The other bit of research was indicating that uh, um, the life expectancy at birth between richer areas and poorer areas uh, hasn't actually decreased. If anything, it may have increased. I know all our colleagues have been working day in and day out to reduce inequalities for, um, you know, health. But for some reason, we appear not to be making a significant impact on reducing uh, life expectancy or the, reducing the gap in uh, life expectancy between richer and poorer parts of our city. So I was wondering if you could just answer those two questions. First of all, what may have caused a slight decrease in every life expectancy nationally? And secondly, why inequalities in health are not budging despite our various efforts? Uh, uh, thanks, Councillor. I mean, uh, I mean uh, really, I mean, a, a really complex question, um, but but I'll give it a go. I'm, I'm fortunate that I'm not on my own on this call. We've got a resident expert, we've got our, our director of public health, who's far better at this than me. But if I kick off and ask Robin to to help me, that I'd be grateful. So I think it's really important that we go back to that slide because I think the answers are, are there. Where you've got the the 20 percent, you've got that, that chart with the 20 percent and all the different wider determinants. I think that's where we need to focus. And so. So when you look at this, sometimes you can feel a little bit um, deflated about how much progress are we making and, you know, why are we not accelerating in the way that we want? But if you look at uh, the the true uh, causes of 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 health outcome and health inequality, they they're incredibly broad. Um, the the percent related to direct care is, is that 20 percent and 80 percent is that wider determinants and it, and it's it's that it's that's where we need to be looking at together I think that's where we need to be um, really focusing our combined efforts both both from the actual delivery of care itself to to those what I'm calling health and well-being prevention areas and in that sort of macroeconomic space. I think there's more we can do, to be honest, uh, there about being really coherent on who's doing what and why and, and all rowing in the same direction. But but that that's why the truth of the matter is we've done more health health care in, in uh, we do more health care every year than we than we've previously done. I mean, that, that that's a position of fact The we're seeing more patients than um, than, than we previously done, you know, outside of, of this COVID episode. So it can't be just about doing more more care. And, and I think that's where we need to focus. But 
I, I, think, I think your question is at the heart of it. Robin, have you got any more to, to help me with that complex question? <laughs> and, uh, it just um, a, a rephrasing and agreeing with you, Chris, there. And, and I think Perfect. it's just a reflection on the the really good uh, improvements that we made over sort of 20 or 30 years on life expectancy. A lot of that was due to um, treatments for cardiovascular disease and treatments for cancer. And, and it is almost as if we've... We, any improvements in healthcare now, we're making very, very small gains in that life expectancy because we've come such a long way. And the issues now that we need to challenge and to deal with, the, the growing issues that we've had that have influenced life expectancy have been around obesity and excess alcohol intake particularly. And, and those two things have been influencing the prevalence of conditions such as diabetes and liver disease, which has started to have a greater impact on people's health so it is very much um reinforcing that issue this this is about much more around the um preventative and the earlier actions we can take in regard to lifestyles so that we can reduce the prevalence of some of these conditions thank you robin thanks chair okay thank you um does that answer your question free to a degree yes to a degree yes <laughs> There is no perfect answer, I'm afraid, but we'll, uh, Chris, we do need to work out how we how we review all this and when. Uh, have you any thoughts on that? When might be the appropriate time and the mechanism for doing it? Yeah, I think I, I think I think I think we've got working trains. So I'm, I'm really cognizant of the, the work that the two health and wellbeing boards um, for county and city are, are doing together. Uh, and I know that in, in the next couple of months, there's, there's going to be a further session that will 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 work out. I think what 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 are the agreed combined um, objectives of, of both boards? Uh, you know, what 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 do both boards want to do together, and what do they want to do separately? I think that will be an important step. I think that will then give us the the vehicle for having that conversation about saying right what. What, what's the health and well-being board going to focus on? And that's where we do it. And, and what's, what's joined up Care Derbyshire going to focus on? And then if I take the Derby City example, um, you know, what, what are we going to put in the, that sort of macroeconomic space that, um, uh, that, that, that sort of, from the Derby point of view, the partnership board, what will, what will be our ask of that? Um, in terms of improving uh, life expectancy, health and life expectancy, I think I think I think there's a way through it. I think that what joined up Cardiabs can do can be much more coherent in when it comes to these other partnerships about the ask and be more clear about what we're doing and what we need to work in partnership. So I'm quite hopeful, Chair, that that, there's, that there is a way through it and, we, and we've got a plan. Uh, and sort of in the new calendar year, I'd hope members of this board would, would see it coming together. Okay, and of course, by then we might have a clearer, slightly clearer picture on the on the legacy from COVID in relation to treatment and delays and, and things like that. So, good, uh, Lucy, you wanted to come in. Yes, I did, and I, I, I um, Chris, I very much appreciate the the your presentation and the direction and the sort of consolidation and. Um, the bigger picture, I think you were right that it was unclear as to where it was going, and I think that what you've said helps that a lot, and I hope it's helping people throughout the sort of wider organisations as well, because the clear message is that if we are all working together, we can achieve so much more. Uh, I, th I think some of the elements that you pulled out there, such as, as um, the sort of intelligence side of things and communications are absolutely vital. But what didn't seem to be big enough, and it may be something that you can um, think about further, is the role of people of, as patients, as the populace of Derby and, and Derbyshire, and how they fit into all this. At the moment, it feels a bit as though the, they are being provided with and done to. Whereas if we are going to actually improve people's health, they are absolutely part of the answer. And that's why the communications and the intelligence are so important, so that we can we can get the right messages to the right people at the right time. Um, and I think that is also partly what we need to do in terms of the 
the equalities and the gap that Fareed's highlighted, which is, um, is, is something we, ought to, we, we need to continue to be ashamed of. And I'm, I'm pleased it's again there at the heart of your thinking because um, that's what we're here for. So I, I'm very much looking forward to the next step um, and, and hearing at our next board or the one after how things are evolving. And it'll be brilliant when we can see, see people engaging in whatever way they need to engage to make this happen. So thank you very much for that. Uh, th no, thank you. I, I couldn't agree more. I, when, when I'm putting a presentation like this together, I've got to be so careful because I, I could talk for hours and hours. I, I, and I didn't include a slide about um, the, the people that work in the health and social care system, joint care system. I mean, we, we together, between, between just the NHS and local authorities, we employ a lot of people. And they, they connect with a lot of people. And so one of the aspects of work we're, we're looking at is, is, is this anchor approach and what we could do together if we, if we, even, if we even made a start with, with our people uh, who, who directly work with us. And, um, you know, just improving health and well-being there would be a, a massive start. So I, I, couldn't, I couldn't agree more and um, look forward to coming back, certainly. Okay, so I'm conscious of time. I think we probably need to move it on. But just a, quick, a last one from me, Chris. Um, in terms of messaging, um, getting the message out to people who are a little bit sometimes COVID and the lockdown has potential to have a dramatic effect on people's health, um, mental health in particular, but also their, um, some people have got a fear of going to the doctor in the current climate or think they don't want to bother the doctors with bits and bobs. How, in messaging wise, how we, I have seen some, but can we, uh, is there some way in which we can improve the messaging to uh, encourage people to continue to think about their own health and addressing any issues that they have? No, I couldn't agree more. And um, uh, we've got a, we've got, we've got a, You'd expect it to say this. We've got a joined up communication um, approach uh, and um, engagement approach. It, it, I mean, it's vital, isn't it? It links to what um, Councillor Kerr was saying there about um, our population is our asset. Um, so we, we've got we've got so much to do, isn't it? And we, we, you know, of course, you know, a lot of learning from the past, but we've got more to do. So I couldn't agree more with you. And um, we've done a lot of, um, obviously, in wave one of the pandemic, we we did a lot of communication because a lot, a lot of patients stopped coming for for non-COVID related things. And uh, we, we recognised the impact of that. And we did a lot of work in the summer to bring those back and, and, and we'll continue to do so. But thank you. And no, I agree with you. Okay, well, thank you very much for that, Chris. Um, I think we do have to move on. I think it's uh, on the agenda. It's Robin next, I think, with a Health Protection Board update. <clears throat> thank you. I'm just hoping that these slides are coming up. Are you able to see those slides? Yes, we've got them, Robin. Thank you. Lovely. Thank you. Um, so the health protection update today, there's a um, health protection update from the Health Protection Board, which was on the 6th of October. And the particular focus of that board, as you as you might imagine, was around uh, the screening and immunisation services. And then also an update on COVID-19 as well, as you would expect. So uh, just thinking back to the Health Protection Board when we met, and it was very much a reflection on how uh, screening and immunisation had uh, functioned during the first wave and how services were managing during the summer. So all of the screening programmes had continued. Um, none of them were ceased over the period of the first wave, but some aspects of those programmes needed to pause just purely because it, it, providers weren't able to carry them out during some periods of that of that wave. And so over the summer, all of the programmes were under a recovery programme. 
but you can imagine that some of those programs were particularly challenged and just for an example um, breast screening has been particularly challenged because a lot of that service is delivered through mobile breast screening services and hugely difficult to ensure social distancing and any volume of individuals passing through those mobile services. Also, cervical screening um, it continued all the way through um, through the first wave and into the summer, but um, there were challenges with um, primary care capacity to deliver that. But also, as we were just mentioning, the reluctance of uh, patients actually to go to practices and to take part in those screening programmes. So all of the programmes are under recovery at the moment and obviously the second wave is going to have a significant impact on their performance. Um, but we are monitoring through, through the Health Protection Board and there are also programme boards for all of those screening programmes as well so that we can keep a close eye on how performance is, is improving. From an immunisation perspective, some really good news about the school aged and the childhood immunisations. Uh, Derbyshire Community Health Services deliver the school-aged immunisations and managed to deliver some really innovative programmes over the summer using drive-through services when the schools weren't open uh, and are now picking up the school flu vaccination programmes as well with great success. So they've really managed to keep that going. And from a childhood immunisation perspective, there were there was a small dip in access, but actually parents have been continuing to take their children forward for their immunisations. And I think that that's quite a positive story about willingness to still continue to access primary care. But there are catch up um, processes in place for all of the programmes. And just important to note, during the first wave, the screening and immunisation team at Public Health England were redeployed into the COVID response. And so um, there was little support from the commissioner for the providers of these services. It was really a, a very skeleton service that was left behind. Um, so they were brought back into the screening and immunisation service in the summer and have been able to focus their time much more on restoring those services. And also not to forget that Public Health England is uh, about to go undergo a reorganisation and we don't currently have clarity where the screening and immunisation commissioners of these services are going to sit. So we wait to hear um, the news on that. So from a from a COVID perspective, um, I don't think this will be news to anybody. We've had an acceleration in cases since the beginning of September, and that coincided with an increase in people moving around, return to school, return to university, people going back to work. And then in Derby, we moved into tier two measures on the 31st of October and then into the national measures on the 5th of November. So quite quickly afterwards. Uh, and just on that, it's interesting to note that those areas in the country that moved into tier two or tier three ahead of us do seem to be having um, an earlier slowing of their cases. We've got an indication for this last week worth of data that there is a slight slowing in our cases, but other areas uh, were ahead of us. And I think that's really positive news as far as those tier two and tier three measures are concerned that um, Hopefully over these next few weeks, we'll be able to build up the evidence around the impact of those measures. Um, and clearly, as, as Chris, Chris was mentioning, this period of time has had a significant impact on the local NHS services. And we are now moving into the second wave and uh, hospital admissions are significantly again impacting on other NHS services. So from a local perspective, we have uh, an internal outbreak response team in the City Council and we've been very focused on supporting particularly schools and businesses uh, when they're struggling with managing cases and self-isolation to make sure that they've got the, the correct advice. We've been doing much more in-depth local data analysis and uh, shortly I'll just come on to some of the uh, charts from our weekly report that's published and we're, we're doing more on this and extending this all of the time. And we're now working to develop a local contact tracing service. As you'll see, there are other areas in the country that have already got these established. And Leicester is one of those that's been doing this for some time. And we're in the process of um, developing this with the Department of Health and Social Care and Public Health England. And we've also had a very widespread 
communications campaign, but also within that some focused work with some particular groups within the city. So this is just a, a chart to just demonstrate to you as a picture, really, where we were in the summer, what's happened with the increase in cases and how that increase in cases is starting to slow. So the orange bars are the pillar two community testing and the blue bars are the pillar one uh, in hospital testing. And you can see that around a month ago we had a really significant doubling in our cases. And since then, we've had a slowing in the growth of them. And then this particularly is, is showing the, the slight glimmer of positive news for us. So the purple line is the 17 to 21 year olds and the pink line is the six, over 60 year olds. And we can see that both of those in the latest week have just shown that flattening off of the increase in cases. Obviously, that's only one week. We wait to see what happens with the next week worth of data. But it, it looks like um, we're hoping for a positive direction on those. And just a final picture here. This is the uh, the latest week's data around where the cases are in the city. And these are displayed as rates just because that takes into account the size of the population in those areas. And you can see that throughout the pandemic, we have had a particular focus in the cases around the centre and the south and the west of the city. And you'll see that that's continued in the in the most recent weeks as well, around Sinfin and up into Littleover and Micklover areas, particularly in the latest week. So I'll just stop sharing that now. And uh, very happy to take any questions on any of that update. Any questions? Um, Lucy's in first there again. You're getting quick at this, Lucy. Uh, I went for a typing training course once. The uh, I, I just like to say thank you very much for the introduction. I don't think it's with directly us, but the introduction of the the testing stations, the walking state testing stations in Derby, because I think that that's a um, a positive um, development. I don't know how that is working alongside. Is is that very much a sort of um, standalone central national thing or is it something that works along what's happening in in Derby separately or uh, is it with track and trace is it part of what they're doing I don't know how does it how does it integrate uh, the walk-in testing centers yeah um, yes yeah, so we work with Department of Health and Social Care and Deloitte's who deliver the testing and that and the whole purpose is as you say to to improve access to testing so it's all held through the central testing portal and um, so people book through the same portal to go to any testing site across the country. And for residents in Derby, for local testing sites, we've got the three walk-in sites in the city. There's Toyota, which people can drive to, or you can order a home testing kit as well, which obviously takes a, a little bit longer. Uh, and, and our role in that has been to work with Department of Health and Social Care and Deloitte's around finding appropriate venues, but then the, um, the building of the site and the delivery of the site it very much sits with them. Okay. Yeah, it's working. Thank you. Good. Thank you. Uh, Danielle? There, Hi, you... yeah. Um, a couple of questions. Um, first of all, are we thinking about moving towards the mass testing to um, identify people that are asymptomatic to try and isolate? Um, and my second question, um, regarding the immunisation, child immunisation, catch up, um, is it linking in well with children in care? Thank you. So from the from the mass testing perspective, um, these these tests are really quite new, and, and actually um, the evaluation of the effectiveness of the tests was actually published yesterday. So we've been having a little look at this today. What I really wanted to understand was the potential impact from um, I, false positives and false negatives. So this test is different from the one that's used in the testing centres. And what are the risks around either telling people who are positive that they're negative or telling people who are negative that they're positive, both of those being really. You're on mute, Robin. Yes, yeah, so I'm not quite sure what happened. <laughs> so um, <laughs> so um, 
so now we've got that information, we can look further into that and just understand the implications. And that's that's what I was waiting for, really, before we um, made any further decisions. There are significant impacts with the um, the testing around staffing and delivery as well, and also around the ability to undertake the contact tracing. So. It, it's something that we're absolutely looking at, but we'll be really interested to learn from the other areas that are that are already picking it up. Um, from the childhood immunisation perspective, um, I will have a look into that for you because the information that I've seen is very much um, looking at the programmes on an overall level, and I haven't seen any information that relates specifically to children in care. So I'll have a further look into that for you. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Webb. Thank you, Chris. Robin, uh, there's been a number of questions raised about rapid tests uh, across the country, and they're asking because Derby is now in a situation that we don't want to be in, is the rapid test resource something that we should be looking at across Derby, particularly with the guidance that the students are being given about uh, going home for Christmas. I gather that the University of Derby have been told December the 9th is the day to go back and uh, whether rapid testing before then, uh, if it proves positive and then uh, a full lab test after that. I don't know what your thoughts are on that. Yeah, so, so as I'm, I mentioned about the, the evaluation just being published yesterday, so we've only just had the data to understand those implications around the false positives and the false negatives, the reliability of those test results, which is really important, particularly in this situation where we're asking people potentially to, to not go home or to delay their going home and to isolate. Um, so it, it's something we're looking at closely, and, and I think it's important that we don't get distracted by the testing and forget what the really key measures are for managing the virus. And, and what we do know is that we need to ensure that individuals who have symptoms ask for a test, and there are fortunately now plenty of tests available for those individuals, and that when they do have a test, that they and their household stay at home until they know the result of that test. And then if it's positive, that they understand how long that they need to stay at home for. And that we're not getting that right at the minute. Nationally, we're not getting that right at the minute. Um, and so testing further adds a great deal to that, but it, it, doesn't, um, it, it doesn't take away from the fact that when people have a positive test, they need to know what to do and they need to be supported to do that. From, from a university perspective, um, I've had a couple of meetings with them this week and we're meeting again on Friday just to talk about now we've got the evaluation to understand the um, potential implications for their students and just to be really clear about um, if somebody has a negative test, the chance of them being truly negative because um, it's so important if students are being tested and feeling that they're going home with that secure security of a negative test um, that they really know the potential implications of that so it, it is very complex but the university are working with us really closely okay any other queries for robin what i'm waiting robin um my understanding is that around half the authorities, 67 of the major authorities, accepted these tests. Um, we didn't. We're not in that. I've, I hear what you say about resources to be able to use them. But from my point of view, take the university example. If, if the students are going to go back home um, as of the 9th of December, which is better? Is it better to go home? without any testing, so not knowing your status, or, or to take a test that at very least gives you an indication one way or the other. And, and then, that, then, you know, if with a positive with that test, then you can follow that up with a, uh, a full NHS test. Uh, what do you say to that argument? Yeah, so um, it, is, it is very much about 
being clear about what the implications are. So um, I've got a meeting with the university in the morning specifically to, to talk about this issue so that if students are tested, they've got real clarity about the chance that they are negative and the chance that they are positive um, so that they can use that information and, and not feel that they've they've got um, a safety ticket to go home. Um, and, and there's just thinking through the real implications as well around when these tests are done, making sure that students aren't um, tested too late and, and left isolated in their isolation. Um, so there's lots of issues around that. Um, but as I mentioned, it, it really is understanding the potential harms of, of the test as well, so that that can be brought into the into the decision making. And, and that wasn't clear to us until yesterday, until the evaluation was published. Sorry, can I just ask them, where does the decision lie as to whether we take and use these test kits or, or not? Uh, so far, what's happened was that um, Liverpool put themselves forward as a mass testing centre uh, and, and they went ahead and did that. And um, all other directors of public health were written to to ask if they were interested in piloting the 10,000 tests. And that's where the 60-odd um, local authorities have come forward to say they were interested in piloting them. Um, but um, so far, that's all that's happened with it. But perhaps we could have a discussion at, um, at the engagement board next week. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and probably we've reached a, a convenient point to move on, actually, to sorry, the next thing on the agenda, which is yours as well, I think, in terms of the Outbreak Prevention Board and the work uh, being done there. I, I think Alison was... Going to, are you there, Alison? I think Alison was going to pick this one up. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's that's fine. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Yeah, great. So, yeah, I think this is a, a very brief one, Chair. It's just for the um, for the board to note. So, just under the the national requirements that were introduced in May, there was a requirement to both prepare a local. Um, outbreak plan but also establish a local outbreak engagement board and given the, the role and responsibilities of the health and wellbeing board in relation to the health protection of the, the local um, population we felt it appropriate to establish that group um, as a subgroup of the health and wellbeing board and given the time frames and expectations around that and the fact that there was there was no um, board happening within within that immediate time scale um, under the delegated decision making powers of yourself the the chair we established that that board under those arrangements so that board has been established and running now I think it's since June I think we we had the first of, of those those meetings and that's obviously continuing to to run as as Robin just mentioned there's the one next week so it's just to for the board to to know really the the terms of reference um to that group I think we're attached also for information so I think that's all I wanted to say um chair unless Robin's got anything she wanted to add in terms of detail in relation to the the function of the board Nothing further from me to add, but very happy to take any questions. Robin, it might just be appropriate at this point to say something about what we've what we've found in analysing the numbers and figures and hotspots or no hotspots. Or um, uh, we have had uh, some outbreaks in care homes, a residential uh, setting, and uh, where are we at with the university? Have they? Or the residents shown any particular hotspots or anything like that? I think um, things have gone relatively well, I would say, in lots of settings. And I think what, what we generally have seen across the city is um, 
generalised community transmission when we're seeing the, the increase in the numbers. And a lot of settings in which we see cases, we're actually seeing um, the impact of people contracting the virus within the community and they're being detected within, within those settings. Um, we, we've recently done some work which we'll have a report shortly to share on um, using the mosaic data to look and see if there's particular sections and groups of the of the community who are being more impacted. So that that looks at descriptions of types of individuals in the city and groups them together, uh, which which gets over the, um, the difficulty of plotting by where people live, which can sometimes be misleading in understanding that. And, uh, and what we have seen is all of those groups in the city have been impacted by coronavirus and um, on a relatively even measure, except for two groups who have been more impacted, who have been the, um, the 20 to 30 group and the 30 to 40 group who are live, living in settled accommodation, working often with young families. And that group, particularly this time in this second wave, seems to be where we're seeing slightly more cases than we would expect from the average in the other, in the other groups in the city. So we are seeing quite a distribution, and as we saw on the map, particularly around the south and up, up to the um, west side of the city. Okay, so another aspect of the, of the, that's really important is communication. And we recognised along the way that uh, different groups, different age groups, different generations and things, um, we have to communicate in, communicate in all different ways. We've used um, the uh, underpass that's in there to communicate a message and we're looking at other ways of dealing with, with the public houses of the campaign, district centres etc just to keep the, the messaging going because there has been an element of COVID message fatigue, people uh, losing the will to live in terms of, of the messages that repeatedly coming out. There have been subtle changes but we just need to remind people of the basics. I don't know, Robin, if you wanted to mention some of that work that we, that's been involved. Uh, ab absolutely, yes. So, um, yes, so you may well have seen the uh, district centre campaign has started to roll out and there's a few materials. We have to do, do the right thing for Derby messaging and um, what we've done with that is to localise it to the district centre so that um, people feel more, more ownership of, of that message. And we've also been working with Community Action Derby as well, uh, use, using their links into um, some of the voluntary sector groups in the city so that we can create a network through which to disperse information rather than just simply relying on one method of doing that. Okay, good, thank you. Any questions for Robin or, or Alison on this subject? And from my point of view, thank you so much for the work that uh, you're doing here. I know how intense it is because we've shared um, some emails at all sorts of times of the day and weekends and things. So um, I do realise and appreciate the, the extent of the work that goes into all this. Um, any questions? No, good. All right, we'll keep on timetable then and we've actually allowed sufficient time for Steve on this occasion being last in line to present his, his piece on Derby's Mental Health and Crisis Support Services Report. If you're there, Steve. Yes, I'm here. Thank you and good afternoon. Um, I just briefly wanted to um, share this report with the board. Um, it was actually done last year um, between uh, the middle part of the year so the information in it now is is a little bit um, dated but it's still quite relevant and if I can just cover the key findings of the report um, it looked into the um, uh, individual services that are involved within mental health care from general mental health problems through to crisis support um, the report show, has shown that many different services can be involved in someone's care and they are 
and there can be many complexities involved on an individual level and pathways are not always clear and straightforward. Um, the key messages that came out of it were that communication is clear, pathway, it's important that communications are clear, pathways are easy to understand and to follow, capacity needs improving to reduce waiting times to assessments, services and follow-up and that GPs need more training and support in regards to mental health and pathways. Um, people um, mirrored this quite effectively but were um, very uh, impressed with the support that they got and the staff that gave that support. But the main aspects of service is that people would like to see improved in work, uh, more services and resources, access to services and waiting times, education and information, assessment, treatment plans and care, and above all else, communication, which really um, runs in line with what Joined Up Care Derbyshire are trying to do. And um, I think, uh, Hopefully, over time, things will improve. Thank you. Steve, thank you for that. Thanks for the for sharing the report with us and things. It's, it's actually quite interesting that the report was um, done some while ago, but as, as we've, and Chris might want to comment on this, but we've already touched on the potential effects of COVID in terms of mental health, both through lockdown procedures or fear of um, fear of the actual uh, virus itself or the pressures brought upon by uh, loss of employment and other other things the, the current climate can only highlight the needs for that which is highlighted in the report for uh, good communication and uh, the ability to wherever possible to step up services Steve have we got any measure of, of the level of increase in mental health issues yet? Uh, sorry, Chris. Uh, yeah, yes, Chair. I mean, we, we do. There was um, there was there, there've been a couple of published reports actually um, showing um, the changes that that we've seen, and there was one that we're connected to um, through the uh, Midlands and Lancashire Commissioning Support Unit um, that 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 has been able to track. I have to say, um, in, in sort of Derby and Derbyshire, we, we have been able to monitor, obviously, changes in demand and also some of the more high level um, types of services that, that, that are being requested, I, I suppose. So we, we've got a reasonable handle on it. It's like the bit that we don't know is what you're alluding to and we alluded to earlier is, is the, the longer term and some of the socioeconomic changes and what, what we think that's going to bring. And that, that's where we don't have as, as good uh, predictive data, but, but it's important. The, the bit I would say is, number one, I always, these are always helpful reports uh, that um, Healthwatch prepare. They, they, they feed into the work we're doing. Uh, number two, pre-COVID, um, I hope that slide that, that I did showed that mental health, one of the three important health and social care areas that we need to work on. And that, that was that was our view pre-COVID. And then thirdly, you know, obviously, in, in line with all the impacts we've seen, it, it's going to need a, a renewed focus. The position at the moment, though, is in, in mental health services has been one of consistent busyness. So um, unlike some other areas uh, in the health and social care system, we saw a change in demand. Actually, mental health services have been relatively constant and, and somewhat increasing, um, which is, is different to some other areas. So a really important issue. And um, thanks to Steve for, for bringing. Thank you. OK, thank you. Roy, you indicated. Thank you, Chair. Uh, yes, there has been 
quite a dramatic improvement in services available since the COVID outbreak. And there's now a 24-7 helpline that is available for mental health support. Uh, that is proving very effective and very well used at the moment. And we've also got links because I'm a governor on the Mental Health Trust with A&E, with GPs and uh, crisis teams, also the Samaritans. Uh, so that is out there. People are using it. And Steve has done some really good work, or rather Health Watch has done some really good work in highlighting some of the issues. And COVID has actually triggered a swifter response to some of those communication issues uh, that has proved beneficial. That's the report we're getting back. I wish IFTI was here to be able to respond to it. Okay, Roy, thanks very much. So is there anything you think that we might, as a Health and Wellbeing Board, be able to do to support the, uh, the necessary uh, and health services that are, uh, are needed. Right. If if we're always saying that you know things are picking up and it's something that we'll we'll need to review, then Danielle, you you indicated you wish to speak. Yes, thank you, Chair. I just wanted to know, um, do we know how much demand has actually risen by? And does the, author does the health authority have, have the um, appropriate capacity to be able to meet projected demand moving forward? I think Chris touched on some of that. Did you, is there anything else you could add, uh, Chris? To yeah, yeah, to so, so, that? yeah, certainly, Chair. Um, yes, yes is the answer. We, we, uh, in, we we know quite um, uh, definitively the the trends that we've seen in the de in the demands for care um, and the types of, of of demands that are coming through. I think um, the the challenge is is, is it's sort of linked to, to what we were talking about earlier in terms of uh, the impacts of COVID, um, the uh, the totality of care we want to do. And, and that's going to be a challenge um, in, in the months to come, in the, in the sort of here and now, about um, how much care across the board we can do, given the, the direct impacts of COVID, particularly on staffing. So we're going to have to think very carefully, as health and social care system, what, um, what, what priorities we, we may need to, to focus on um over the months to come so I, I certainly can't i'm afraid i can't give you assurance um that um we can fully meet all all the demands on on, on the service from from a mental health perspective I, I don't i don't think i could give you that assurance um what i could give you assurance on is that a we 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 understand the demands that we're now seeing we've got uh a quite a robust system approach to working through those demands and, and prioritising against them. Um, and I suppose, Chair, this is this is going to be one of the key areas that um, Joint at Kedab is going to be wanting to talk to Health and Wellbeing Board about in terms of this wider health inequality. So, so mental health as, as a as a subject matter area is, is you know. It's going to be something we, we, we want to talk about, so I think I think the presentation's timely. Absolutely, I think mental health is going to stay as uh, one of the priorities that we need to look at. I'm just wondering, if Steve. Thanks for the for the report and for um, for all your team's involvement here. Is there any way that they could, that we can um, for next time understand? Uh, a bit more about the statistics and and how many um, 
how many calls for service there are or, or the growth or otherwise in in the national health in the mental health arena so, certainly chair i mean we um i'd be happy to ask the mental health delivery board um who who's the the sort of um, multi-system partnership in joined up care to to, to come back to the next board with a, a sort of position statement of, of, of where what we've seen, the trends, the patterns and, and what we're predicting going forward, if that would be helpful. I think that would be really helpful because, again, by that time, we will, we will start to understand more about the, the longer term effects of, of COVID, particularly if we can be on the way out of it. Great. Well, that's great. Thank you very much. Anything else for... Uh, Steve, uh, we don't have any other business, but is there any other private issues that anybody needed to raise or, or uh, anything before we finish? Nope, good. Well, have a great day. Thanks for attending. Thanks, Alison and, and um, the people for preparation of the items and the work that goes on behind the scenes. And we'll see you all next time sooner rather than as long as it took to arrange this one. Thank you very much. Thanks, Thanks Chair. Thank you. 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 Bye. Chris, can I have a